Hi, I'm Tony Morales, and welcome to another edition of All Access with Film Music Media. I'm here with my buddy Kaya, and we are going to talk all things film music and TV music, and possibly a little bit of scotch. Talk and drink. <laughs> Well, Tony, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here to your studio. It's so great to talk again. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to see you yeah. and to uh, catch up. Absolutely. So let's start, uh, you know, we d we've done interviews in the past, but, you know, let's start fresh for people who may not know you or just coming to you for the first time. And uh, I want to know a little bit about your, your background, your intro, like going back to your childhood. When do you remember, I guess, music making its first impact on you where you're like, okay, this is something that's resonating with me? Well, I, uh, as far back as... Kindergarten and first grade, um, you know, child of the late 70s, was very much into um, rock music. In particular, Kiss was a big draw. And uh, I was part of that young kid generation where, the, you know, Kiss probably got to a point like, wow, we have kids coming to our concert? <laughs> that was me and my parents. Um, so at that point, uh, I had, you know, all their albums and just couldn't listen to them enough after school. and. My parents, um, I remember them buying me a drum kit after begging them, and once I tore through that, I, got, I would just play on the albums, and then eventually it led to a guitar. It would be a quieter thing to buy. <laughs> and, um, but once I got the guitar, it was, just, it was literally just big and heavy, and I did, it, like, that's as far as it got at that point. So fast forward a couple years, um, when I was nine, and uh, I got a little bit more courage to try it again. I got a little bigger, I grew, and then a real, uh, turning point was we had a neighbor up the street who played guitar and he happened to play all the music that I wanted to learn so he he kind of kick-started things for me because I could actually tangibly start to test music yeah. and, and I guess express myself and so um, had some lessons with him learned how to play a bevy of Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne. We're just talking about my <laughs> exactly, um, and and then I was kind of on my way, um, and that led to essentially learning everything he knew at the time, which was all just by ear and just you know tablature. This wasn't you know any traditional study at that point, and I went on to essentially teach myself with books and um, you know was heavily you know into rock music and. You know, this time we're in the 80s and all that stuff, and it, it just kind of continued. So by the time I got to high school, um, it, had, it had gone on, and I was ready to learn more. I could kind of, I went as far as I could go as far as showing myself and guitar tablature, and I needed to learn how to, you know, I needed more. So my parents um, signed me up for traditional lessons, and at the same time, I was fortunate enough to go to a high school that actually offered um, a music program and had mm -hmm. music theory and they had jazz band. And so I was just like a sponge and I just, you know, took classes in, in jazz band and I was taking classical guitar and I was learning electric guitar and learning how to read music and it all just kind of kept going. So then what, at what point did you find uh, film music and when did that start? When did you decide to make it a career? Like when did at a point you were like, okay, this is what I'm going to do for a living? Uh, great question. Well, so all that, um, all that kind of upbringing and, and studying my instrument led me to look at music as a career. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I had in my sights was to be a possibly a studio musician because I, I, the whole point of all that, all, everything in my adolescence learning was just to be, you know, the best guitar player I could be. So yeah. it just seemed like it was something I wanted to give it a try. My parents were supportive enough to say, okay, you know, we'll send you to music school and, you know, if I can get in. And so uh, I applied to Berkeley College of Music and got accepted and attended there. And um, <clears throat> uh, freshman year, I um, had a buddy who had taken a, an appreciation of film music class. Mm. And at Berkeley, all the students that are incoming have to go through a certain, um, certain levels of musical proficiency and education aside from your um, focus. Right. So right. I was there to shed and play, you know, <laughs> eight finger solos, but I had to take classes in arranging and counterpoint and ear training and all that stuff. So already my scope was widening. Mm -hmm. So when I heard about this film music class, I just thought it sounded fascinating and I took it. And um, one of the things that really made a major impression on me at the time was um, Jerry Goldsmith's score to The Omen. Oh, yeah. Because it, to me, I, I equated it very much to like a heavy metal yeah, score. Yeah, of course. And coming from where I came from, it was just, it was fascinating. 
And um, I just, I couldn't believe that somebody wrote that and that if, so that was my discovery of it. Mm -hmm. And um, from there it led to learning more about, you know, Bernard Herrmann and at the time, you know, Danny Elfman was, was, you know, humongous in the world, Thomas Newman. And so I just turned my focus at that point and all, with all the composition classes I had to take, I also saw, I switched to film music as my major and just dove in deep. So what was the kind of the first step into getting the, that first job? You mentioned you're, you wanted to, you were aiming at studio mus- being a studio musician and you mm-hmm. did, you did work with Harry on some scores mm-hmm. and of course you worked with uh, Brian Tyler on a bunch of stuff, but what were kind of the first steps and did you learn from becoming an assistant and just kind of absorbing everything and what were the first like things you were able to get your fingers on? Um, well, it's, so it took, you know, my, my path kind of took, um, it, it, you know, it took a, it took a while to kind of figure out for me how to make an entrance. When I got out of school, so, well, to, to kind of catch up, so I graduated from Berkeley, mm-hmm. and then I also heard about a fantastic program at USC, which was the, uh, um, the um, film and TV music um, program there at the time, which was an advanced studies program, not a graduate program like it is now. So I moved out to California. I applied to the program. I got accepted. I moved to California and took the program. And then when I got out, I felt like I was one of the only graduates who did not get that assistant job or I did not have a lead. Yeah. And to be quite honest, in hindsight, I just didn't know what to do. It wasn't as, it wasn't as, um, uh, what's tangible as it is these days where there's yeah. networks of ways to kind of figure out who needs something and, and all that. So I actually took a job for three years out of music, not mm. and just a job at a dra- graphic design company and paying bills and at night continuing to score student films and you know my buddies would call and be like oh so and so has a you know need for an assistant i i I applied to be an assistant for mark shaman and um actually david schwartz because i had another friend who worked for him but i just didn't have the technical yeah skills because you know again this was like you know when i graduated 96 (laughs) and we you know pro tools wasn't so huge and and all the computer things so yeah those who knew that stuff had a humongous leg up on it right so Fast forward to three years later, um, I, I had a, a, a chance encounter with um, Harry Gregson Williams through an ad. Uh, a friend of mine and I lived in an apartment in Venice we just moved into and we, we overextended <laughs> and we couldn't afford it. So we put, up a, um, we put up an ad for Roommate Wanted at the local pizza place, Abbott's Habit, I'm not sure if it's still there on um, Abbott Kinney. And in walks... Um, this woman, Melissa, and she came with two of her friends, one of them, Harry, and, and another, and Harry's wife, and um, it was a random chance encounter. Well, we asked her to move in, and we befriended, we all became buddies, and about six months later, I kind of realized who Harry was, because he was kind of new in town, maybe about a year or two. Yeah. And I got the courage to give my cassette, <laughs> said, hey, you know, I'm a composer too, and you know, da da da. So um, that actually led to him passing it on to uh, someone over at Media Ventures who were in the commercial department, and um, they were looking for young writers to do some freelance work, and um, they gave me a shot doing a blockbuster, a blockbuster video commercial. Oh my god, that's amazing! <laughs> and um, I did, I demoed, and I got the commercial, and then I spent the next year because they just it, it almost it was serendipitous. I actually left my day job. Yeah. Right around the time I gave him the CD or I got the call and I just kind of was ready to temp and just make yeah. it happen. Yeah. And it just so happened that because that worked out, I got hired to go there for about um, a little under a year and work on staff as a commercial composer. And um, start that was basically the beginning. Wow. Um, That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's super random. and um, But uh, pretty incredible when I look back on it how uh, it just kind of happened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before we focus on some of your uh, your your projects, uh, I'm kind of uh, interested in kind of your uh, approach in general into just whether when you work on something, uh, where does the first note come from for you? What is I know it's going to be different depending on what kind of project you're mm-hmm. working on, but typically do you have a process that you do? Do you like to watch a first cut of the film? Do you like to talk to the director or the producer? Do you like to read the script? I mean, what's kind of the general thing that you can kind of get ideas start pulling out of your head? Um, well, y- yes, like you said, it's going to be different mm-hmm. depending on what I'm, I'm involved with. Um, but the one thing that's universal on no matter what I end up working on is, is, is the first thing I want to do is get as much information as I can. 
And whether that's conversations with the filmmakers or the and television the producers, showrunners, um, seeing the cut, do they have tent music, do they not have tent music, just absorbing everything, trying to, um, within the schedule of things, make the most of the little bit of time you have before the clock starts ticking and you have to write music or and start producing things mm -hmm. and just try to marinate in it as much as I can throughout all that. Um, and then usually what I get to and what I look forward to getting to is, is essentially just starting to test um, ideas. Yeah. Um, and that is that comes with a lot of you know improvisation um, or sound palettes or maybe I, if I just don't have any clue and they don't have any direction for me as far as you know what they like, then I will I will sit down and sometimes just listen to music. Mm. Put it to picture, see if it sticks, see if it, how it feels. Maybe it tells me that what I don't want to do, or what it what doesn't work, um, and um, you know, eventually hope that I get there. I mean, I usually get there to some degree. Yeah, yeah. But um, sometimes <laughs> it's longer and harder than others. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you've you've done so many varied projects in different genres, um, and I feel like genres are each kind of come with a territory of types of music that come with it. Do you find different genres more challenging than, than others? Or do you kind of just see, doesn't matter what the topic or the tone of anything is? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> everything is, um, everything is tough to, to be vague, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all... Usually I hear comedy and horror kind of the more harder ones, but... Comedy's I, hard because, you know, rarely do you get to ask to write music that's funny. Yeah. You know, do they... You, Doing comedy and particularly, and again, um, trends and music change. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I will say, because I've been so immersed in it in the last few years, I will say animation is probably the hardest thing I've ever um, had to work on to date. Right. Um, just because it's it's really, um, I don't know if this does sound pompous or the wrong way, but it's like really honest composing. For so, sure, yeah. meaning there's no hiding, but there's no like, there's no taking notes off. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be purposeful, and um, you have to be able to do all the shifting and the and you know playing the animation. And particularly on a show like um, like I do with Elena, there's a lot of uh, comedy within the storyline, and they, what they want is a cinematic sound, and hitting all that stuff and trying to do it as elegantly as you can um, is really really hard well let's talk about Elena because I mean congrats you got an Emmy nomination Thank uh, you. for for your work on the show and and uh, talking about genres working on uh, children's animation mm -hmm. which you know I work at Cartoon Network so I'm, I'm in mm -hmm. that world as well and over at Disney I used to work at Disney but I mean talk about the, does that change uh, the approach at all I mean what, what when you first started the show you're on season three uh, end of season two season three in a couple months yeah so when you first started the show what were the kind of talk like what how did you find the sound for Elena? I mean, what was the process to get there, and then how did the show evolve, I guess, across those two seasons so far? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, they, um, you know, they, they're a, a fantastic team to work with. They've always been really supportive and really, like, you know, n nurturing and helping, helping me whenever I got to a place that was like, you know, okay, how do we want to do this? The, the, the initial discussions when talking about the sound of the show was to figure out how to infuse... Um, Latin overtones mm -hmm. with the Disney um, enchantment sound mm -hmm. because uh, you know Elena is inspired by all Latin culture all over the world, not just one country. And so, how do you umbrella something like that? Yeah, um, it was very difficult, and I went and arranged from early, com you know, score tests from you know very very legitimate, you know, maybe something that felt like um, you know. Mexican folk music to less orchestra to really full orchestra that has more of that Disney sound but we can infuse some guitars or some Latin percussion in there and just kind of try to write to find the balance and I, it took a good I would say at least um, uh, at least halfway through season one for me to really really get comfortable and feel like I started to figure out the balance between the two and that I didn't yeah. necessarily need to lean on one or the other for the show. Just kind of tell the story, um, try to you know keep it as cinematic as you can possibly do with what we have to work with and, and support those um, 
indigenous or ethnic storylines as they come and, and then, you know, pepper it throughout the throughout the series. And is it a is it an 11 minute or 22 minute uh, episode? It's a 22 minute episode. Yeah, so, and, and one 22 minutes, so one story in the Right. So how, I mean, in a typical 22 minute episode, how much music is is being used or utilized? A lot. Because yeah, um, I feel like it's different than most other animated shows. It's heavy. It's heavy. Yeah. Um, you know, they Yeah, it's just been and we tried to do this at the beginning. We tried to come out of the gate not wall to wall scoring, mm -hmm. but I failed. <laughs> no, um, it just didn't. Which is know, not a bad thing. <laughs> it's fine. It's just, yeah, it's just, um, you know. Because usually, usually those shows are just like little stingers and transition points. But if you get to like flesh out, I mean, yeah, stuff like I mean, that, that's you know, really I, great. I learned a lot on the show. Um, I really, really did a lot of studying of uh, all of my heroes in animation music. You know, John Powell and Randy Newman and John Debney and watched a lot of what, um, how they would, very gracefully score and continue to score and not feel exhausting and and or redundant in what you're doing musically um the thing with elena is there's a there's a song in every episode now i don't write the songs there's they have a dedicated songwriter um amazing uh, composer this guy john cavanaugh and he will co-write the songs with whatever writer co-writes the lyrics mm -hmm. They do those, they pre-produce those. So those are done before the animation happens. Okay. Um, so that relieves at least two and a half minutes for me per episode. <laughs> and then um, and when I have two songs in an episode, I'm just like yes. dancing. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so that's, it's just, it's just kind of, it just works that way. It, now it's to a place where when you come out, you feel it. Um, if it's too long, you feel it. And the show just is a fast paced show. It's television. It's, you know, it's 20 minutes, they have two commercial breaks, so part of the art of, of that is to keep the momentum going. Yeah. And um, it's rich with storylines, and, and there's usually like a couple of lines going in one episode, and they've got um, serial um, storylines and characters that come back and recur and keep going, so, um, you know, it's a lot to support, but it, it's been a blast to, uh, to work on. It's been tremendously educational. And I always hear that tele TV schedules are, are just crazy hell and just super, uh, is, it, is it similar, is it comparable to like a network show that you do? Like yeah, it is because it's, you, 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 you have more days than technically you do mm -hmm. on network. Like for example, um, when I was in Scorpion with Brian, we yeah. would have uh, anywhere from five to, like from spot to deliver. Yeah. We would have, I mean, five at the worst times, but <laughs> usually around seven to nine days. Wow. And from spot to delivering the score to the stage and handling revisions at the end of that and then starting the next one. With Elena, we have two weeks from spot to preview. But the difference is, and, and it's actually half the amount of time as the other, the difference is um, style. You know, with, with the Scorpion had a more contemporary and uh, was definitely not orchestral. And there's just... Um, the programming the orchestra all in the computer is is super time consuming and particularly when you're trying to do a, a Disney really full winds brass percussion you know very wide it's even more time consuming so it's a full two weeks <laughs> yeah. um, so yes it's it's comparable even though it's shorter but it's 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 yeah it's still a lot more <laughs> Yeah, we were just talking about Elena of Avalon, so let's switch gears to live action, which you have a, a film uh, coming up, An Actor Prepares, which uh, you get to reunite with uh, director Steve Clark, which you worked with previously mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Um, so talk about uh, this film and and what challenges it bring. And when you first started talking with Steve, um, what were the first conversations that you had about what the music needed to be for this? Um, yes, yeah, so the second film was Steve Clark. Um, awesome guy, awesome director. He's based out of New York. And um, when he first reached out, um, I was thrilled to hear from him, and we talked a bit about the film, and I was able to watch a cut, and as we kind of talked about earlier, it's, 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 it was going to be a comedy score, and mm -hmm. I, you know, we, had, so we had a lot of discussion about that, but the film actually is more of um, a coming-of-age story. Yeah, describe what the film is. It's, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a coming-of-age story story about mm -hmm. a father and son who had an estranged relationship who uh, come together over circumstances and have to spend a lot of time together and then uh, end up understanding one another better. Starring Jeremy uh, Irons, right? So yeah, so the father is <laughs> Jeremy Irons and the son is um, Jack Houston. And um, 
it's you know, it's a lot of fun. The movie is. There's a lot of humor in it, and um, you know. But at the end of the day, it does have some emotion to it, or it does have some heart to it. That's probably the better word. And so when Steve and I were talking, that was the real that was the real challenge. How to um, how to give the score some heart, but also not overdo it with 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 anything that felt sappy or or modeling. Yeah. And uh, I had a conversation early on with. Um, a producer on the film, David Rosenthal, who was um, helped, you know, in kind of relaying, like, make sure, you know, we want to try to give the score, um, you know, have it have it sound special and, and and just be a part of the fabric and not overtake it and not, you know, steer you. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, so th that came my way and. Um, in the rough cut that I saw, there was a lot of songs, and there was a lot of songs that they were gonna um, keep that I heard, mm -hmm. which I thought was real beneficial because I could get the tone of what was gonna be in the score that was gonna be song um, related. And they had a few temp tracks in there, but not a lot. So I also was happy to, to hear that and not get too sucked into something that may or may yeah, not yeah. have been the right approach. Um, so, Based on that um, and some other uh, conversations about instrumentation, we kind of made a collective thing to avoid piano as, as much as possible just to, to try to, again, about just being careful not to be too emotional. So um, talking about my upbringing with the band, I thought this was a great opportunity because I um, to, to kind of go back into a band kind of mm. world with the score and play... Um, um, you know, make it be a band, you know, guitars, bass and drum, some textures with the guitars, and uh, I think we used a melodica, some Rhodes, just, you know, like a band setting, and score the film like that. Um, so I came up with a, like, a light motif for um, Jeremy Irons' character, Atticus, um, and, and then an overall umbrella uh, theme that um, kind of put in this indie pop genre, and um, and it seemed to work and it seemed to stick and not not make it too emotional, but felt it really works well with the songs when they come in and then when the score comes in, it's kind of all one. Um, is, it, is that a, I mean that sounds like a challenge to me to navigate like songs it, it, to weave everything to make it seem cohesive. Is that a trial and error process where it's like okay, this tone needs to match. If it's going to dovetail into like something else, that ever happened where you score dovetails into a song, or do you have kind of some space between? Oh yeah, I mean it happens. It certainly has happened before in other projects. And mm -hmm. this one, I think they we didn't actually physically go into each other, but you know, one scene would have a score track, and the next one would have you know maybe a song interlude, mm -hmm. or you know, because there's a lot of time you know as they're as they're doing the road trip um, where there's montage and, and other stuff, and, and song was mostly um, supporting those. Right. But then. Um, there was a couple of times where you know score came in for, because it just made more sense to do, and we didn't want it to seem like okay, here comes the orchestra, and then here comes the band, <laughs> and then here, you know. Um, so uh, I did, you know, I did what I thought worked, and collectively we, you know, we figured it out, and it seemed to have a nice cohesion to it. How how is it different this time working with Steve that you've worked with him before? Mm -hmm. um, you know. It, People are always interested in the kind of the director-composer relationship, and everyone always, you know, you know, John Williams and Steven Spielberg, you know, how it evolves over d several decades. But this is your, only your second film, right? Second film. Yeah. So, but since you had worked with him before, was there any kind of shorthand at this point, or was it did it feel like you knew Steve like kind of better than the first time, or was it different at all? Um, well, it's a good question. Well, it's you know, it's it's challenging because this film was very different than the first film we did. Yeah. Um, the first film we did was was also kind of a coming of age, but it was more of a drama. Mm. And um, so sensibilities were gonna be different and um, approach and, you know, that was also, uh, I wanna say f maybe five years ago. So it yeah, been yeah, some, time some time in between. Um, I think one thing that was beneficial was obviously having gone through it with Steve before, um, I, I, I had a little more confidence that he trusted me, and it wasn't like a first-time job. Like, don't lose this job, you know, get through it, make sure it's great. So we had a little bit of that hap like helping us in our conversation. Um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, it was still, it was still, it was still new film, and it was a new tone. So it was challenging getting there. But you know, I think just the thing that helped was just having gone through it before and feeling, you know, comfortable with 
his presence and our shorthand of communication. Right. That's like really key to yeah. um, new relationships is developing the shorthand and being able to translate what, when they're telling me something, maybe positive, negative, whatever, that I'm able to translate that and that it comes with, um, you know, practice. Yeah, absolutely. Is it, um, um, when you were working with a director, um, what kind of, I guess from a composer's point of view, what kind of direction do you like? I mean, and, and this we've, you know, your opinion, I guess, but um, do you like directors who give a lot of notes and a lot of, you know, like p opinions of their point of view and everything, or do you like a little bit hands off, a little bit more freedom? I mean, what's a, or is there a good balance between both? I mean, I'm sure you've had super controlling micromanaging directors yeah. and producers, and you've probably had people who are like, I don't care, whatever you want right. to do. But so where's the, where's the balance that you like? Are any of my directors going to be seeing this? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, you don't have, no names, no, no names. Um, you know, I mean, the the more information, the better. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I think with any part of creating and collaborating, um, you know, trust between the two of you is the ideal place to get to. It doesn't always, not always a realistic um, thing or goal. Right. But um, you know, when there's <clears throat> when you're able to, and it works on both ways. You know, when the director or producer or showrunner comes to you with an idea. And and you go to them with an idea, and you know if you're if you both can hear each other, and let's say, or you're open to to hearing each other, and um, can take that and turn it into something that you both really believe in and, and fall in love with and get behind, then for me that's the ultimate goal. I know um, you know notes. You're going to get notes. Everybody's going to get notes. Yep. I'm going to get notes. The editor is going to get notes. The um, everyone all down post gets notes. It's just yeah. part of the business. You know, yeah, yeah. Again, it's part of collaborating. But, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, if there's a way to talk and through things and, you know, you can always kind of come to a common denominator um, and get to the ultimate goal that you're trying to get to in a way without getting, you know, confrontational or uncomfortable or yeah. anything like that. Do you ever feel comfortable saying... Actually, I think you're wrong, and I think this is the correct way to do it. You I know, mean, I mean, it's never. Well, I think that that is only not with that verbiage, but saying, "Hey, maybe you should try this." You know, yeah. I mean, you know, politicians, or you know, it's it's <laughs> if you can have a way of politically, or you know, just you know, being like a bit of a, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I was gonna. I have, I have a friend who's a producer on a show, and and they call the, her the Velvet Hammer because she has a way of. <laughs> <laughs> Being the nice guy and yeah. the tough guy, and that's all the same. I think there's a way of just communicating something, and if you really believe in it and you really feel strongly that you want to make that that call or that opinion or that suggestion, mm -hmm. by all means. I mean, yeah. if you have a good trust going back and forth, you can always say it. They can always hear you. They can always say, you know what, that might be a good idea, or I think it, I think I want to try it this way first. Let's see how it goes because that yeah. happens a lot too. Like yeah, yeah. you know, it's always a guessing game. You're not quite sure what you're going to get into. Like okay, we we talk, we can talk to her, you know, dry and you know, run out, lose our voice. But until you sit down and start doing something, um, it's hard to predict. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's collaborative. So it's all about kind of getting comfortable with working other pe with other people. And speaking of collaboration, you've done a lot of collaboration with other composers and co-composing, um, of course, with Brian Tyler, um, Ed Rogers, um, mm -hmm. John Debney. How does the dynamic change um, when you're working with another composer? Uh, what, what, what is, I guess, what are the benefits of having two minds working on something and kind of complementing each other? Well, you, um, I mean, it's great. You get, you, you kind of, you get to share ideas, you get to share inspiration, you get to um, learn. Uh, I think it's fantastic, and you know, I think it. It also it varies depending on like where you are as yourself as a composer. You know, so uh, by meaning, when I, um, you know, when I met John and and Brian, you know, I was I was a younger composer and still kind of learning my craft, and still, and I, you know, looked to both of them as um, you know mentors in a way, mm, yeah, yeah. and was learning a lot from them and um, at the same time building my confidence and um, you know being opinionated and trying things and in and, and, and trying to impress not only you know um, the filmmakers but them really yeah and be like you know you know it became like a musical 
collaboration. It was, it was did, fun. Did, was that a, a great place to also to fail, to learn from mistakes? Like having, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because, um, you know, I would, if I send something over and, you know, because when you do a collaboration, when you co-compose, at least in my experience, mm -hmm. you're always listening to um, each other's work or even as a arranger, I did a lot of arranging or they would hear my work and, and you know, it would always get talked about and or revised, polished before it goes to mm. production yeah. for preview. So any times I would get notes back and this and it, and it, all across the board, composition, um, producing, um, programming, uh, the list of educational, you know, the bucket was deep. <laughs> um, it was great and, and it, was, um, it was perfect for me and for you know, who I was as a composer at the time and where I was headed and where I wanted to go. And, um, you know, almost like a second education at times. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and I, I enjoy it. I still enjoy it. If the, you know, the right things come up and we can put it on the schedule, I, I would love to do it again. I think what you, you got, you, you and Ed did for, uh, for Bloodline, I thought was really cool. I thought oh, that was a you. great show and a great score. You guys so did. much fun. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that, to that point, you know, Ed, on another side of things, Ed and I met at the SC program, mm -hmm. and uh, that was like you know working with my best friend. It was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was it was a different kind of pressure for the two of us, but also fun because we I kind of felt more in the same boat. You know, with John and Brian, it was like you know, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, you know the bright light guys. But you know, it was a, just a different kind of thing. But um, such a such a good time. Absolutely. Um, so you do have um, another movie coming up, uh, Wish Man. Uh, which is uh, uh, and when is it released at for that? I don't know. So we just finished the score. Right. Um, film's called uh, Wishman, um, directed by Theo Davies, and it is the it's a biography film. It's about a co-founder of the Make a Wish Foundation. Right. Right. And his backstory, and um, just finished. We just mixed that in August. So it's an indie film. So right now it's going through the um, sales, trying to absolutely find trying to find a distributor. Yeah. 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 So. Um, to be determined, and um, but it's coming out. I'm really, really excited for that one. It's um, and yeah, I mean, talk about scoring a film. Of course, it's it's a, not a documentary; it's a biography, a mm -hmm. biopic. But when you're dealing with real people and real lives, does it change the approach at all? When you know that you know people who know these people and they're themselves could be watching, and you know, just like, does it change how, how you how you do your job? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I know it's funny because... there's more pressure? <laughs> I don't, well, yeah, I mean, there, I knew that he was getting, well, similar to like Scorpion, you know, the Walter Real or Walter O'Brien, um, it's funny, funny, funny tie there. So the uh, producer on Wish Man, um, when I first got on and started working with the job, says, oh, you know, I'm good friends with Walter O'Brien from Scorpion. <laughs> I was like, really? I was like, oh my God, that's wild. So, um, so yes, his real life, and then, then the, the movie that uh, we're working on is about uh, the real life. Um, uh, person and yeah, I mean, I know he's going to be seeing it. I know they're going to be playing music for him, and and he's you know he's not necessarily involved in the creative, but because it's about him, obviously he, he's going to be around. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I felt a little bit of pressure there. But and, and as you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, I settle in, and and it's just me and the director and and, and the story, and and uh, you know, slight pressure, but it doesn't it doesn't. Um, petrify me or yeah, yeah. You know, anything like that. <laughs> um, so kind of going back to some uh, big picture uh, kind of discussion, uh, just a, your general approach. When you're, uh, I was talking with, uh, actually with Ryan Tyler recently about mm -hmm. uh, about confidence, and you mentioned confidence earlier. Um, how, where do you find, I guess, the confidence that you need for this job? Because you do need a certain amount of confidence to be able to talk to somebody and, you know, you need to have, be kind of believe in your ideas and get behind your ideas. Did that come naturally at the beginning or did you have to kind of work your way into how you present yourself professionally with all these other kind of collaborating storytellers? Yeah, um, great question. I think confidence for everybody is going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, um, you know, uh, without sounding too confident. Exactly, um, but <laughs> you don't want to sound too pompous. You know, <laughs> I think for me, I needed to do a lot of writing for a long time um, before I felt I could, before I felt confident in continuing to write. Right. And that means a lot of writing, a lot of writing music that um, people rejected, a lot of writing, a lot of writing, a lot of music that people loved, and just, you know, all over the spectrum of it. Um, it's like a muscle and it builds with, you know, time mm -hmm. and repetition and um, getting comfortable and learning who you are. Um, you know, one of the things when I came in as a as a you know young composer was I didn't really 
think too far out like who am I because I came from um, a really traditional composer film composer world meaning yeah I studied music of film composers and I had this rock and roll background from like my youth but really I was studying um, you know Thomas Newman and Danny Elfman and, and Bernard Herrmann and what these guys were doing and it took a while for me to get to a place to absorb that mm. and let it go and decide okay I'm not going to be Bernard Herrmann. Yeah. This is not going to happen. There's, they're not looking for Bernard Herrmann scores right now, and, and what am right. I going to do with that? So it took a lot of time to f decide, okay, what am I good at? What am I decent at? And yeah. how, can I, how can I expand upon that? And what do I want to do that may be different than that and grow that way? And You're finding your voice, essentially. Finding your voice, yeah. yes. Because if you want to be... Hans Zimmer, it's not going to end well because there's already a Hans Zimmer. There's already a Hans Zimmer. So you got to be yourself and find what you have to offer. I and guess. it's really hard yeah. to, that's a hard thing to, to look in the mirror and do, really. You know, at the yeah. end of the day, it's a, you know, there's obviously, the, you know, there's so many wonderful composers and right. there's, there's so many, you know, there are opportunities, but, you know, there's a lot of people that people can choose from. Um, I think, um, you know, just being confident in, in, in yourself, continuing to practice. Um, being a collaborator and you know a good attitude goes a long way too you know I know people um, certainly appreciate a, a, a calm you know presence or yeah. a, you know they want to be in the room with you and just hang out with you, you know, yeah. that will do a lot yeah because then you can go through those tough conversations of like <laughs> right. okay I gotta talk to you about your confidence in your writing <laughs> um, but you know seriously it's it just takes you know and I think maturity comes into it yeah I think, you know and everybody has a different sliding scale I'm sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's true. Um, and when you deal with rejection, I mean, which can take a blow to your confidence mm -hmm. because this, this industry is nothing but rejection, whether you're getting fired off a project, which is going you know, get replaced, yeah. or a piece gets rejected. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with that? And I mean, is it, of course, you can't take it personally, but did you ever take it personally at the, be at the beginning? No. Well, since I'm talking <laughs> about that, <right> <laughs> I'll take a sip too. I won't let you so get me hang in. Step one. <laughs> Rejection. <laughs> rejection. There's a rejection. Mm -hmm. mm. Drink the pain away, step, yep. step one. So, <laughs> <clears throat> <whew. coughs> wow. <laughs> um, Petey, okay. So, um, you know, I don't know. For me personally, um, you know, you, I think trying to understand why <clears throat> you either got rejected or lost a job or didn't get a hired for a job you mm. really wanted to get on to. Um, you know, some things are out of your control. Most things are out of your control. Um, if, if, and, you know, having a moment with it. Yeah. Okay. That sucks. Or yeah. That doesn't feel good. And then moving on. Yeah. Because, um, you know, there's nothing positive about hanging on to, you know, yeah, it's not gonna bad do, feelings. Do you gonna it's get... not going to do you any good. You're not going to go, you know, there's nothing to do about it really. When it's moved on, you get moved on. You can't. Call back and say, hey, let's just, you know, one more time, please. <laughs> just listen to it. You'll yes, love just, it. I promise if I turn up that, that one part, um, you know, it doesn't work like that. So, you know, uh, it's part of the game. It never gets easy. Yeah. It always hurts. It always feels um, personal. But usually it's never personal. Right. It's always about a creative uh, business and... Um, and you know, the like it's I for said, the film. It's for whatever is the picture is for the film. Yeah. If you get a cue that gets, you know, I mean, it goes all you know, big things like you know, losing a job or not getting hired, down to getting cues thrown back on you, mm -hmm. and you know, you just you just turn around and you you know, you lick your wounds and you you get back up and and keep going. Yeah. Um, so to to wrap up, uh, looking at the industry today, um, and you've been you've, you've grown in this industry for for. You know, many years. What are some thing, good things that you're seeing right now in 2018? Uh, what are some bad things? Maybe things that could be improved upon in terms of the music industry or maybe entertainment industry in general. Um, well, um, let's start with great, you know, positive stuff. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the good things, I feel like there's all, there's so much going on right now. There's so much really great content out there. Yeah. There's, um, that's exciting. I can't even keep up with all the great content as far as a viewer goes, you know, um, which is an exciting thing because you like always know if you get a lull in life and you're just <laughs> sitting around and you don't have kids. And, and you know. <laughs> um, So that's exciting to me. I love um, 
you know, discovering and, and learning new names and new composers that have been out there. You know, as you know, I've, I've, been, I've been in town what feels like a really long time. So um, I see, you know, I'm definitely in touch and I, you know, I watch and I'm, and I'm a fan of, you know, a lot of, you know, new work that I end up discovering or composers I never heard of, but I see, I see a, a product and I'm like, wow, what's that? It's fantastic. So that's inspiring. It keeps you going. You know, it's kind of part of staying fresh and um, I feel like, uh, you know, really um, blessed and fortunate to be around, you know, what feels like a really, um, you know, important time for film and TV music, yeah. maybe an evolution of it. Um, it's exciting. And uh, to be here and to be working, it's just, it's an honor. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I don't know about, um, you know, I, negative. I mean, who wants to be negative? I don't know. <laughs> say bad things about people. I mean, you know, I don't know. You know, sometimes, you know, all I can think of is, you know, I, if I had to wish, I would just wish maybe there's a little more time to do more time. Know, post yeah. stuff. But, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's like a never ending, you know, all composers yeah. will say the same thing. Um, but, um, yeah. No, for sure. Well, uh, Tony, thank you so much for, for your time tonight. It's, it's, of course, always a pleasure to chat. And uh, me. I mean, congrats on all the amazing work. It's always a pleasure to, to hear you grow. And I've always been listening to you since you started. And so it's a, a great pleasure to, to pick your brain. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure.